no Mickey show. Clash momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from elites, oligarchs, stay fed, deep state, faith fed. Everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion, and this melted pot. We live in time to build a new system. Unionize labor rights. Highlight the issue. Talking heads left is best. The saga continues. Continues. The No Miki Show. Hello and welcome to the Nomi Key Show. I am Nomi Key Konst and it is Wednesday, July 21st. Uh, as you know, we have this new show program uh, format, which is Wednesdays and Fridays airing at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. You get the same amount of show that you would during the week when we had a daily show, uh, but it's just two days a week now. And so you have longer programming, longer interviews. Uh, we're having a little bit more fun with it, except as soon as we started doing this, uh, you know, Every place on the planet started having climate change issues, like it's been going on forever, but um, extreme heat indexes, floods, power outages. And I I know we talk about this a lot on the show. I I know I've been on the road uh, a bit over the last few months, especially while I was doing the the documentary in Puerto Rico. But there, this, this I think needs to be discussed in a more global way. This isn't something that just countries and regions where austerity exist. These aren't just the problems that they face. The infrastructure issues, as we know in in the US right now with the showdown over the infrastructure uh, bill loom, this is a constant everywhere. And as climate change worsens, and as cities and different regions have more pressure on them to react to climate change, you're going to be seeing more power outages. You're going to be seeing uh, folks who, who can't get on Wi-Fi and do their business um, you know, we all got very comfortable working from home or comfortable, I should say, for those of us who were able to work from home, those of us who could work from home. Um, and now, you know, businesses are talking about, well, maybe this is the new norm. Maybe people should be working from home and we shouldn't have office spaces. And then some companies are saying, no, they should come in. But the reality is, is that our infrastructure is not set up because of our own austerity, not forced austerity, but chosen austerity because of the way Republicans function in this country and neoliberals function. Uh, as a result, we are not prepared for what is happening and what is to come. We're not prepared for pandemics, clearly. We're not prepared for climate change, clearly. But there's a domino effect of how this, is, that, how this affects business, how this affects uh, you know, everything from air conditioning to heat, uh, to being able to keep, lev- keep levees in place so cities don't get drowned out. This is happening everywhere. It's not just happening in the global South or in poor communities or in Africa or, or places where extreme austerity is put in, Southern Europe, Puerto Rico, Detroit. It's not just happening in New Orleans. It is happening everywhere. Germany, which we're going to discuss today on the show, uh, you know, one of the wealthiest countries in the world, has faced insurmountable floods and hasn't been able to prepare its citizens for these types of floods, but also protect its citizens. And they're, you know, if not the most productive, one of the most productive uh, countries, supposedly, uh, in, 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 in the EU. Or efficient, I should say. <laughs> I'd like to say efficient. So this is the new norm. Last week, uh, you know, we had issues in New York City where there were power outages and our show uh, wasn't able to broadcast the time when it was supposed to because of the power outages and Wi-Fi went down. And then this week in Greece, I had the same issues. I wasn't able to keep the Wi-Fi going, and so I wasn't able to appear on the majority report. Of course, there were power outages happening when the power authority in Puerto Rico uh, went privatized, and I wasn't able to air our live show during several days a week. But this is going to be happening everywhere. And as we're as Washington right now is in a showdown over the infrastructure bill, I believe that Democrats need to change their language and say, this is forced austerity. Nobody can hide. And so many of these regions are offering these major tax breaks to wealthy people to come and invest in, in, in their country or their re- region or their city. And we all know that that never works out. But the infrastructure isn't there to even support those folks. So they complain that the infrastructure is falling apart, the roads are falling apart, of course, because they're not paying taxes, that the internet's not stable, that the air conditioning goes out, the power goes out, you know, the water uh, doesn't always flow. You know, we've heard this all. But 
No one is to be spared. This is the new norm. If you live in New York City, you know very well that the MTA has been starved. Public transportation has been starved for decades. And some of it is even irreversible. When there are signal issues, the signals have not been changed for 100 years. The famous uh, MTA, the, the guru, had to step down because he wasn't able to work with Governor Cuomo in amending these problems and definitely at, not at the rate to keep up with the city of New York's growth. So we are in a crisis. And I don't think that Washington is, at, Republicans surely are not acting like we're in a crisis. But Democrats aren't either. Democrats aren't talking about this as if we have been under extreme austerity in our country. I talked to someone here in Greece whose daughter is going to New York uh, to work for a few months. And I mentioned that, you know, you, if you can afford to move somewhere close to where she lives because the public transportation is unreliable. And always show up early because you don't know if the subway's going to go down. And she goes, what do you mean? I thought that just happened here in Greece. I started laughing. I said, no, that's happening in New York. The idea of the United States is so different from the reality. And I know progressives, I know we understand that. But we have to start messaging around that. We have to start messaging that the infrastructure bill is about, about protecting ourselves when climate change comes to our community. It's not just a green new deal, green jobs, green infrastructure. It's about having the infrastructure in place to protect us so that we're still able to produce, so businesses can still function, so people are alive when the, the power goes out and the air conditioning isn't flowing when, there are rec when there's record heat, so the elderly have access to water when the power goes out, which if you may recall, only eight years ago in Manhattan, that happened in lower Manhattan. But for over a week, people had to transport water up flights of stairs to elderly because the power was out and the water was linked to the power grid. This is the norm. It's not the new norm. This is the norm. So this infrastructure fight this week, today, this showdown, is not just about the future of green jobs, the future of jobs in this country. It is about how we as a society function as climate change comes at us in, in, in worse and worse ways every single day. So today we have a wonderful show. Uh, as you know, we have a two hour long show. Our first guest today is gonna be Ceci Blanchard. She's gonna be talking about how uh, government is making, and bureaucracy is making it more difficult to protect those who, have, uh, who, who are trying to face treatment. Uh, that is addiction treatment, which is obviously something that uh, is on the rise right now in the U.S. with opioids and others. But uh, she's going to talk about how bureaucracy is making it more difficult. And then later we have Al Alberto Medina on to talk about the smears against the independence movement of Puerto Rico, uh, why statehooders are flipping the script and trying to point to the independence movement as being the right wing, which, spoiler alert, they're not. Uh, and then later we have a great panel with Rep. Rab. Rep. Chris, Chris Rab is back with Natalie Scher to talk about some of the craziest stories of the week. We'll be right back after the short break. Ceci Kulabara Blanchard is an independent journalist covering drugs and trans life. She is uh, the program director of DSA's Opioid Overdose Prevention Program and was previously a staff writer at Filter, uh, which is the only online publication dedicated to covering harm reduction. And Ceci is based in New York. Ceci, thanks for joining. Thank you so much for having me. So I wanted to just start off because um, I don't want to say I feel like it crept on us, but I, there, one day the opioid crisis became a, a an epidemic. And I feel like, at least through the public, public lens, it happened overnight. And then immediately on the left, as we should, maybe it's because it was during a presidential cycle. I, I'm not really sure, but... On the left, we, you know, we're, we're like, well, why is it we're dealing with the opioid crisis one way, but, you know, treating black and brown communities a completely different way when there's a perceived or actual uh, drug crisis happening, you know, in the past years. So can you kind of like help us understand when the opioid crisis grew out of control and how it did? Definitely. Um, I think like just like a principle to start with is the reason I think maybe the American public 
found it to creep up on them and kind of appear out of nowhere. It speaks to the social exclusion that people who use drugs face, especially those who are, you know, have some of like the most chaotic relationships with drugs. And, you know, like they tend to be like our unhoused neighbors and generally, you know, people who don't have housing are some of the most socially excluded people. So I think it does speak to generally the, the, their social position in general. But so kind of the general historiography of what some people call the opioid epidemic, um, others call the overdose crisis because it kind of narrowly speaks to the specific type of harm that's happening and doesn't limit it to um, just opioids because as we know, it's no one, if you've ever used drugs, you're never just using one drug usually, you know? Like you, it's fun to mix things. Um, and generally that's just what's happening. Um, and so, I mean, it's, it's usually told like it starts in the nineties as Oxycontin is, um, uh, becoming big, widely prescribed. Um, I'm not really going to dive too much into the Sacklers, um, and the big pharma narrative around it, because I think in some ways, especially currently, they've become a scapegoat for a problem that we can't solve by punishing them. I mean, that doesn't speak to necessarily, you know, obviously how I feel about billionaires, millionaires, you know, um, but generally when we're speaking about preventing drug related harm, you know, prosecuting the Sacklers is not going to be saving anyone's life. Um, but so generally it started in the nineties and then grew throughout the two thousands. And it was mostly, involving prescription opioids or diver diverted prescription opioids. Um, and then... What is a like, diverted, when you say diverted prescription opioids, what do you so mean by that? Yes, yeah, so diversion means uh, the, the consumer, the final consumer is not um, the patient who has prescribed the medication. So it somehow ended up in their hands, whatever, you know, by me, you know, means that happened. Um, and then beginning in the early 2010s, uh, the production of heroin started uh, to really ramp up. And that shift, you know, really speaks to, and this generally is a feature of the dr drug war, is that whenever law enforcement cracks down on one side of the supply, you know, people just immediately move to another area. And that's kind of this like cat and mouse game that the drug war is and how futile it is because people want to, you know, drugs are so useful for so many different things. Um, and there is people want them. And so suppliers will be finding, you know, ways to fill that demand, you know, mostly through like kind of a capitalist model, you know, because the, most of the suppliers want to make that profit. Um, but so heroin started to increase production of heroin started to increase. Um, and so there is, and a lot of people were converting to street sold heroin as a result of being kicked off of their prescribers. And the DEA um, imposed a lot of really um, harsh restrictions, regulations, um, and really carried out a campaign of fear um, against pra medical practitioners who, are, who were prescribing opioids. Um, and a lot of times, two people who had diagnosed chronic pain and other medical issues. Um, and I also think uh, something that's important to note, and I think also speaks to where the color line falls in all of this, is the difference between like the deserving patient and like the drug seeking, like undeserving patient, you know, who just is looking to get a fix or something. Like that's an incredibly racialized distinction. Um, and so how so when you say that, um, so, you know, I mean, and this speaks to generally how black people versus white people are treated in the U S medical system. When white people present and say they are experiencing something that doctors cannot see with their own eyes, they're generally believed. Whereas black people, when they present with the exact same issues are not believed and are instead considered to be lying, manipulative. And the, the word is drug seeking. Um, and so they're seeking drugs either, you know, to um, for like their own unauthorized use or what doctors 
you know, don't want them to be using it for or to be selling them. Um, and so a lot of patients were being kicked off of uh, their opioid prescriptions and then having to turn to the street supply. And then, I mean, of course, all the while, you know, people who weren't being prescribed opioids were also generally um, buying more and more heroin. Um, so that's, so the, the, the prescription opioid seg segment of the history is considered the first wave of the overdose crisis. This is generally how it's narrated. And then the, when heroin production and demand started increasing in the early 2010s, that's considered the second wave of the overdose crisis. And then by the middle of that decade, God bless you. <laughs> um, <laughs> by by the middle of the decade, so around like 2015, between 2015 and 2010, uh, the synthetic opioid fentanyl uh, began being introduced into the illicit supply. And then fatal over, I think we've now surpassed it, but fatal overdoses uh, peaked their absolute historic high in 2017. And that was completely driven by fentanyl, yet also at the same time, DEA is still waging this ridiculous, evidenceless um, fear campaign against doctors to get them to stop prescribing opioids. And that's also, this is a part, a feature of uh, the history that hasn't really been, I think, adequately narrated, but um, doctors uh, now almost, so many refusing just to straight out prescribe any opioids. I think later on, as historians look back and researchers look back, play is I think it's playing a part in the just absolute record high of overdoses from people in the illicit supply because doctors are withholding people from accessing a supply that is, you know, quality controlled. Uh, reassured that you know you're getting um, this opioid and there's not going to be anything in there that you don't want, you know. Um, and activists in Canada are, are urging for um, um, providing these pharmaceutical opioids uh, to consumers to divert them from the illicit supply. So, so this is really interesting because um, I'm in Europe right now and I, I can't speak for the entire EU, but I do know that there are many countries in Europe that just don't write any opioid prescriptions at all. Um, and I mean, I can tell you where I am right now and it just blocks away. There's a circle where people shoot up on heroin there. I mean, they're like past, it's, it's like known for being a place where folks go. So clearly there is a problem. Um, but I'm curious how, how, like, are there, is there a place on the planet where they're dealing with this properly? I mean, is there a right, right way out of it? Obviously you want people to be able to, um, lessen their addiction and addiction programs are really important, which is what we're going to talk about, but, uh, but, you know, banning it outright, uh, taking on doctors, um, you know, suing pharmaceutical companies, you know, it's a long-term project, as you said, it's, it's, it's not, it shouldn't be the central focus, but where are they doing it right? Anywhere? Yeah. Um, I think the Netherlands and I, I am the last person who will be going on and on, you know, about Scandinavia and, and generally like Northern Europe, you know, about, you know, just totally applauding them, whatever, you know, because there's such a different context than the U S and I think, you know, kind of just totally worshiping them for their, you know, healthcare system, all that. I think it's, it, it somewhat irks me. Yeah. They have a little bit of a Nazi problem too. Let's not forget. Yeah, you know, just a, just a little one. Um, a little bit. <laughs> but so for example, in the Netherlands, um, they, a lot of people are able to access pharmaceutical grade heroin, um, from their doctor and the evidence shows, you know, that people are not dying from overdoses, you know, anywhere near, like the numbers are so insignificant. I mean, obviously anyone who dies, that's a tragedy. And that's not to say they are insignificant, but in comparison to what we're seeing in the United States, it just does not compare at all. Um, and so it's preventing overdose and those related harms. And then it also is addressing people's problematic relationships with um, drugs, you know, in this case, heroin, because um, people know exactly where they're getting it from. 
people know exactly how much it's going to cost and that is free, you know, it's not charged, it's covered. Um, and they, they know exactly the, the quantity. And, and it's been shown in research that a part of what drives, you know, problematic relationships with heroin and other drugs, you know, what some people call addiction, and we can maybe talk more about kind of what exactly addiction is, but part of it is the, is chasing the high, it's called sometimes called like chasing the dragon. Um, but it, that plays a really um, kind of fundamental role in driving people's problematic relationships because it's this pursuit of it. But once you have it just readily available for you, you know, and like a white coat is giving it to you, some of the allure and the the high, you know, is reduced as a result. And then it just kind of becomes this other part of your life um, that, that doesn't get bound up with all these other meanings and things. Um, so yeah, I, I would really point to them. And I mean, I think maybe as we go along in the discussion, I'm going to just kind of continue to circle back around to the point that the whole point, I think, of addiction treatment, harm reduction, all of that, it needs to be about people's choice and like self-determination of their body and their relationship with drugs. And I think the current, well, you know, of course, I think the reorientation towards public health as a paradigm versus, you know, um, mass incarceration and criminalization is obviously an amazing reorientation in terms of how we're thinking about drugs. But at the same time, I think with that comes the public health approach and the medicalized approach still is depriving people of the autonomy to determine, you know, how they want to live their lives and how, you know, they want to be in their bodies. Um, and so that, that's a big issue still. And, you know, of course, we're, and we're seeing like some of these public health approaches are um, mirroring carceral approaches. Um, and, you know, we're seeing like court ordered treatment, like diversion. So you're not going to prison, but then you're going to, these so-called treatment programs that if you end up not meeting their expectations, you actually then get a longer sentence than you otherwise would have. Um, so, so I, can we talk yeah. a little bit about this? Cause this is, I, you know, you wrote this article and it's, um, I, it's crazy to me that I, it's not crazy. Obviously it's America. So I'm not surprised <laughs> by anything, but uh, you wrote this in, in the intercept uh, this month. And, and the title of the article is health officials warn historic addiction treatment funding burdened by federal bureaucracy. Um, I, how did you, how did you uncover like this, this, I mean, just, I guess everything in, in this story, because the fact that we have these addiction programs, okay, great progress, I guess you'd think so, but it just seems like it was half-assed and, and yeah, uh, uh, you know, we don't live in a humanist, we don't have a humanist government, obviously. And, and this is incredibly visible in this kind of scenario. So can you yeah. explain just, just what's happening? Yeah. So in the, I guess, would you like a summary briefly of the article or the issue at hand? So the issue is so, and kind of what drew my attention to it or why I ended up pursuing this story is right now, especially within harm reduction communities uh, um, and addiction professionals, they, a lot of folks are applauding Biden. I do think, I don't know, I'll give him this. He has committed, he's, made harm reduction one of the pillars of his drug strategy, which is a historic first, never been done. Um, and he the enacted budget for fiscal year 2021 in combination with the American Rescue Plan Act has set aside um, the highest dollar amount ever for uh, substance use disorder treatment and including harm reduction. Um, so that's an incredible thing, you know, but generally, as a journalist, you know, and as somewhat, you know, skeptic, I like to, you know, kind of be a little bit of a killjoy. Um, and so I, I have, you know, many sources in various health departments across the country. One of them told me about how there is this bureaucratic requirement that for some program are gonna, going to make the uh, funds that Biden and uh, Congress have set aside for treatment basically worthless because this requirement is just so um, 
counterproductive and stands in the way of the entire purpose of um, addiction treatment. And so it, it's kind of interesting. And while I was writing it, it, it I was somewhat, I kept kind of second guessing myself and being like, it's so niche and so specific and almost somewhat boring because bureaucracies are somewhat boring, you know, but it's really important. And the, the consequences are, the stakes are very high. So it's, it's, it's this questionnaire, this like 30 page long, um, hour long questionnaire that's required by the, let's see if I can get it right. The government performance and results act. Um, so it was enacted in 1993 and then updated in 2010, but it basically, you know, is an accountability measure for various federal agencies. And part of it is, uh, collecting data to show that, you know, what, what you're setting out to do is actually working and is actually effective. And so this questionnaire is collecting data to actually see, you know, if their plan is working. And, but with that, they've just thrown every single question imaginable from like lots of different um, tools used by social workers, like uh, psychologists. And it's just has become this total mammoth of a tool that takes longer than what addiction treatment programs require for their own intake, pro you know, because usually it's just like, what's your name? Um, you know, demographic characteristics, like, you know, what substances are you using, blah, blah, blah. But this one just is so it's, it's extremely invasive. Everyone across the board in health departments across the country are saying it's traumatizing, it's counterproductive. Um, you know, and I've talked with service providers and they're reporting that people are getting up and walking out of treatment um, as a result of this because the, the tool. So it, before you can even access the medication um, and so in the article focuses on buprenorphine, which is the uh, gold standard treatment right now for opioid use disorder, before you can actually get your uh access the medication, you know, and, and research shows it's so important when people show up and express an interest in getting help, like you need to act then because if, it, you know, if it's taking longer to access treatment and medication, that'll help you. Um, then it would be to go pick up heroin, you know, on the street corner, people are going to be choosing the faster because, you know, they're going to be going into withdrawal. Um, of course. Otherwise. Of course. Yeah. So, before they can do this, they have to go through these questions. And so like some of the questions, one of them, one of the most kind of horrific one asks how many times in the past month have you been hit, slapped, kicked, punched, choked? Um, and I think anyone, if, if they were experiencing that, would find that extremely traumatic to have to account when they're just trying to get something, you know, that, that they're probably already using if they're experiencing that to cope with that violence. Um, and then, you know, the, the list goes on um, in terms of like just invasive questions, but it's really, this is really significant because even when we're thinking about on this macro scale, you know, with Congress and Biden and the budget and how they're allocating resources, you know, we, we can applaud that. But then I think in a lot of times, I think on the left, we forget that there are actual institutions that have to implement these wins that we see, you know, because they're kind of glamorous and all of that. Um, but we sometimes forget that there are institutions that are tasked with implementing it. And a lot of these institutions just are either not equipped or are equipped with really problematic things. Um, and that's an example of this. It's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, <laughs> anything from the board, I mean, if you're from New York, you know, the Board of Elections is an institution that, yeah, yeah. we'd love to fund it, but then you find out that it's just going to people who don't show up to work. Um, <laughs> a great example of an institution that failed. But, but I, I, I also uh, what really confuses me about this is it just seems so obvious. Like, oh, you're putting more hurdles right. towards treatment for people who are, like you said, like a second away from from potentially um, going into withdrawals and we'll try to look for a faster, it's not like we don't have a ton of research behind this. It's not like this hasn't been something, you know, dealing with addiction and there aren't experts in this field, 
But on top of it, I, I, what I don't understand is like, what are they trying to be holding accountability for? Like, what is to be held accountable? What is, is it quality control? I don't understand why they even have this screening process. Right. And th- that's the thing. Not, not many people who work in government <laughs> like actually know what, why this tool is the way it is. And also we have to like, e- although they're required by statute to um, evaluate their programs, there's, there's nothing in the law that's requiring them to ask how many times you've been, you know, choked, punched, kicked in the last month. Um, and so it's really unclear how the data is actually being used. Um, no one actually knows. And when I talked with the spokesperson for the agency, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration, which is a part of the Health and Human Services, Department of Health and Human Services, they said that it was mostly used for reports back to Congress. Um, and I mean, that's like the what, what the statute says, you know, is like, you know, providing these to, to Congress. So when they're fu- funding and like thinking about the budget, they're informed. But please tell me one congressperson who's going to, who's looking at like how many times they're being slapped, kicked or punched every month. And like, right. And because, because the whole, the whole point is, are you, are you like the whole point? I mean, I, th- at least I think the whole point of treatment should be, is the person doing well, you know, are they being, are they doing all the things in life that, or are they at least working towards being able to do all right. the things in life that they want to or need to be doing? Um, and of course, it's concerning if someone's ex- experiencing violence, but why is that the time or place to see that, you know? So it does somewhat seem like the federal agency is kind of exploiting this opportunity to just kind of dragnet data gather. Um, and one, um, no, a couple experts, a couple uh, state health department officials uh, raised the question of like, why don't they just conduct a study you know, if they want to know these questions, you know, because they are worthwhile, you know, if someone's like, like living with a substance use disorder, like what, what violence are they experiencing? That's a worthwhile question. But why are we doing it at this point in time in this person's life when, you know, they're at such a critical juncture? Um, and that, that's like, I think, a big problem, because all the people who are criticizing um, this tool are not against research, you know, all of them conduct research and like hold research in high regard. The the problem is with how it's being implemented. And then also like the consequences, the very real consequences they're seeing it have on their patients. Um, just last question uh, before we wrap, has there been a response from the agency based on your reporting? Yes. Yeah, so I am happy to say I've, I've learned that uh, they read it and they have reinitiated. So SAMHSA was extremely standoffish, or at least this is what the state health officials have been saying, that it, communication was basically non-existent. Obviously, SAMHSA says otherwise, you know, and that they're so collaborative and work with everyone, but everyone who they should be working with are saying, we don't know what's going on and we haven't talked to you. Um, but I learned that, some of these state health department officials are actually now re- being invited by SAMHSA to re-engage discussion and SAMHSA is considering now uh, reworking it to remove a lot of the really tra- traumatizing elements of it. Um, so that's very promising. But on the other hand, I do have to say, you know, it, this is just one micro issue um, among so many, you know, and still, buprenorphine, which is the gold standard medication um, that I kind of focused on and access to it. That's what I focused on in the story. It, it's so woeful, you know, only 40%, no, 40% of counties in across the United States don't even have a provider who is willing to prescribe it. And that, that can you imagine if 40% of counties across the country weren't willing to prescribe insulin? Like it, it's absolutely ridiculous. So even if there is movement on this one issue, there's so many other things that need to be happening around access to addiction treatment. Well, you may have broken open a conversation and I I have no doubt that there are plenty of lawmakers on actually both sides that might be interested in having a deeper conversation about this, given how often it came up uh, during presidential debates. Yeah. Yeah. Ceci, thank you so much for coming on. We'd love to have you on again. Like keep us uh, in the loop updated on, on any developments. 
Uh, you can check out Ceci's article at The Intercept. We'll post it in uh, the information section if you didn't get a chance to see it. It came out uh, this month and um, very interesting. Super, super interesting topic. Thank you, Ceci. Great. Thank you, Nomiki. Bye. Bye. Alberto Medina is a journalist and he's a communications team lead at Circle, which is the Center for Information Research on Civic Learning and Engagement. It's a nonpartisan independent research organization focused on youth civic engagement in the U.S. Uh, He recently wrote an article titled The Cynical Attack on Puerto Rican Independentistas from So-Called Progressives. Uh, It was in Mano, a Latino counterculture magazine uh, published uh, this month. And it was super interesting because I felt like, Alberto, it was kind of a reaction to like some stuff that's been happening online. Um, But I mean, people say like, oh, okay, things are online. It's not real life. But I feel like it's starting to spill over into real life in weird ways. Like it's setting the tone of conversations in political spheres. So just first off, thanks for joining us (laughs) before I jump in. Thank you. Um, Thank you for having me. No making. I, I should say at the top, I'm I'm speaking in my my personal capacity, not my professional capacity as a as a team lead for Circle. Of course. Um, so, for folks who are not uh, fluent in Puerto Rican politics, <laughs> including myself, even though I'm which is most folks, yeah, <laughs> yeah, most folks, it's it's so complicated. It's like it makes you know. You're peeling back the layers of an onion and then you're like, oh my God, there's another onion and then there's another onion and then there's another yeah. onion. Um, but for, you know, for folks who, who who may not understand the political situation on the island, um, can you kind of describe the dynamics in relation to like how we look at the party system in the States for, for everyone? Yeah, I mean, the biggest difference is that the political parties in Puerto Rico, um, most of them at least, are historically, you know, haven't been Democrat versus Republican. They have been um, parties um, aligned or divided based on the issue of Puerto Rico status. So there's been the, you know, so-called pro-commonwealth party that favors the status quo or some version of the status quo, um, the pro-statehood party um, and the pro-independence party. In the last couple of years, there's a new you know, sort of left of center party that has emerged that doesn't take a, a particular position on Puerto Rico status. Um, but that's sort of the way that politics has worked in Puerto Rico, because it's sort of this question of, you know, before we can even decide what kind of country we want to be with, what kind of politics we want to have, we sort of need to decide whether we want to be a country, you know, at all or or join, you know, the, the United States. Um, and, you know, right now that debate has sort of taken on um, new urgency. There are two bills in in Congress um, that try to approach the Puerto Rico status issue in in different ways. Um, but yeah, as you say, you know it's complicated. the The parties don't neatly align. You know, there are some people on the the pro statehood side that are more or less liberal. A lot of them are you know pretty hardcore conservatives. Um, the in pro independence party has historically been um, you know much more progressive, much more left leaning, and um, that is kind of what. <laughs> Is, is ironic about some of the conversation that's that's been happening that try to tries to paint uh, supporters of Puerto Rico and independence in a in a different light politically. So you know, I often hear from people say, saying like, "Well, I don't understand why are they so obsessed with status? It's, it it hasn't been solved in the last you know since this, obviously this has been a a topic of of like you said everything is based in status. You know, what party you're a part of is based on the status. You know." what party you run under is based on the stats, not mm-hmm. Democrat versus Republican on the island. If you're running for governor, it's, you know, are you a popular, are you an independentista, whatever. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong, this is because, you know, you can, the governor and, and the legislature can pass a budget, but the fiscal oversight board can just say that that's so cute. You know, <laughs> sure, you you don't want to privatize your, uh, your power grid. We're still going to do it. So that's why status is central. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. I mean, Congress has always had plenary power over Puerto Rico, you know, since 1898, since Puerto Rico was invaded by, by the U S and, you know, the way that power has been exercised has sort of changed over the years for the first 50 years um, or well, first for the first couple of decades, it was a military governor appointed by the U S you know, then it was a civilian governor appointed by the U S finally in the 1950s, you know, we get to have our own elections and, and have our own governors. And there's this, you know, kind of slight measure of, uh, of self-government that, that gets introduced. But um, but con- Congress uh, and the United States government never relinquishes that power, um, that absolute power, really, over, over Puerto Rico. Um, and then in the last couple of years, uh, when Puerto Rico gets into this big debt crisis, um, a law called PROMESA is... Uh, 
is passed, it establishes an, an oversight board that we call, you know, La Junta, because it really does govern as an unelected, um, you know, junta of, of American appointed officials who basically control, you know, fiscal and life on the on the island, control the budget, and you know. If you control the budget, you control everything. If you decide where the money goes and where it doesn't, you know, you affect education, you affect hospitals. Right now, today, just today, there is a truckers strike that just started in Puerto Rico in reaction to, to actions that the board has taken. So, you know, it has really crystallized for a lot of people that, you know, the United States is in charge. They've always been in charge. Um, and that's why that's one of many reasons why the status issue is just fundamental and, and should be resolved. And it's, it's, it's happening, I mean, uh, as obviously there's been a, a debt crisis on the island for, for a while, but, um, you know, two years ago, the governor was forced to resign due to massive protests on the streets, um, a combination of obviously many things, but mainly this chat, which I think is important to this conversation, because can you explain um, what happened with this chat and, and uh, the Roseo administration and how it hit a nerve with uh, so many <laughs> people on the island? Yeah, I mean, you know... It's funny, a lot of what people sort of think about in terms of Puerto Rico right now, what they still ask me about even years later is, is Hurricane Maria. Um, and, you know, there was so much, a lot of the attention in the U.S. focused on, you know, Donald Trump's failure and the U.S. government's failure in, in addressing that crisis and the, the thousands of deaths that it led to. And that was certainly the case. But, you know, we on, on the ground in, in Puerto Rico weren't blind to the fact that the local government had been, you know, incredibly um, ineffective and, and corrupt as well. Um, so I think people were still holding on to to that frustration, that anger and, and pain, really, you know, for for so many, um, not just being months without power, as I myself was, but, you know, losing family members. Um, so then, you know, when this chat is leaked uh, in, in 2019 um, from the governor with some of his top aides and, you know, they're hurling insults back and forth to with political opponents. Um, they're mocking, you know, the fact that people died during the hurricane, um, you know, just the kind of worst sort of frat bro behavior that, you know, from, from our nation's top leaders, uh, it really incensed people. And, and, you know, there were weeks of, of protests, um, I was I was fortunate enough to be at the big uh, national strike that happened um, that I think finally forced the the governor to to resign, um, but it was a real moment of awakening I think and you know all these issues as as you say are, are tied together and I think um, you know I was at the protest and sure we were protesting the governor but we were also you know protesting for that unelected junta to to leave you know just protesting for a better future a better life and. For a lot of us, you know, that better life uh, can only come, will only come um, when we resolve the status issue and and hopefully for with a free and, and sovereign Puerto Rico. Um, there was there were racist comments in this chat. There were homophobic comments in this chat. There were sexist comments um, in the chat. And uh, his party it was a statehood party. So this is, I, you okay. know, I want to bring this up because uh, suddenly in your piece, you've talked about how statehooders are hurling uh comments out, you know, smears against independistas um, saying that they're racist. Now, can you sort of give us a background of, of who traditionally the independistas are on the island politically, like if you're going to look at some sort of ideology, not necessarily a party, but, you know, ideologically? Yeah, I mean, the pro-independence movement, <coughs> excuse me, has always been the left in, in Puerto Rico for for many. We've been the far left and, you know, um, what I say in my piece is, you know, we've traditionally and and still to this day been associated with, you know, Castro regime in Venezuela. And these are the kinds of, you know, people just like call us communists and dismiss us. And the FBI, you know, spent more than 50 years, uh, you know, <laughs> keeping tabs on and, and persecuting um Puerto Rican pro-independence leaders and supporters are just random people who showed up at a meeting with the same surveillance programs that they used, you know, against the, the civil rights movement, um, against uh, the American Indian movement, others in, in the U.S. that were seen as on the left side of the spectrum. So that's been, you know, our our history. And to this day, the pro-independence party is the most progressive, you know, party in, in Puerto Rico when it comes to social issues, to environmental issues. Um, to, you know, economic policy. Um, so it is, you know, this, <laughs> this strange irony that I think in, in the search of, of political attacks from those who, and as I say, you know, there is some diversity in the pro-statehood movement. There are some 
people who would consider themselves liberals in it, but it has also housed, you know, the the religious right in Puerto Rico, the, you know, some of the most reactionary conservatives um, belong to, to the statehood movement. Um, I would say, you know, if you are a if you are a pro statehood, you're not necessarily conservative, but if you are conservative, you are probably pro statehood is is how I would put it. Um, so you know, with some nuances as, as we've been talking about, but those really have been sort of the the ends of the of the political spectrum in, in Puerto Rico and how they um, uh, how they connect with the status issue. I mean, they've been very strategic, and uh, there was a you know, to, 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 to relate this to like mainland politics. Um, there was a DNC coup uh, in Puerto Rico a couple of years ago where the DNC members that uh, were members, representatives of the DNC for Puerto Rico, this is before the Tom Perez um, was elected, uh, there was essentially an, an, a, a coup that happened in on the island in which statehood members suddenly uh, took, took over those positions and then conveniently um, helped elect Tom Perez. And of course, Tom Perez came out in favor of statehood, which, you know, was not the case prior to that <laughs> for the official uh, platform of the Democratic Party. And just to put that into like, even more perspective, the statehood, the, the resident commissioner who was a statehooder was the co-chair for Latinos for Trump. That's right. So yeah. it's like you said, you're more likely as a statehooder to be conservative, but they have been very strategic. You know, some of these DNC members are tied to like family members, obviously you don't want to, not every family member is exactly <laughs> the same as you, but some are tied to being the more conservative right-wing um, uh, members of the statehood movement. So, you know, there, there definitely seems to be some sort of like, how do we make sure that both parties in the United States um, are, are on our side in case that, you know, this is ever brought up. But what I don't understand is if they're so conservative, right? You've got the Republicans in the states. And you bring this up in your piece. You've got the the the, the Ted Cruz's of the world, um, Marco Rubio's. You know, whoever they're always saying like Puerto Rico shouldn't be a state. And I don't understand. Like, <laughs> I actually don't get how you can be conservative for statehood in Puerto Rico when if you become a state, you're gonna lo- you're likely to lose your tax benefits. Like, what what is what is the actual benefit as a conservative on the island in becoming a state? I think a lot of conservatives, you know, I think of this as a, as a progressive myself, I think of this in terms of power, right? And I think a lot of people just want to attach themselves to power and to those that they perceive as having, you know, power and, and money and influence. And that is what um, the United States represents for, for a lot of, of Puerto Ricans, um, you know, as someone who's on the opposite end of the spectrum, I think the opposite way, okay, who hasn't had power in this relationship? You know, what does that mean historically? What does it still mean? Um, but, you know, I think for a lot of um, pro statehooders, whether they are, you know, more liberal or more conservative, they just see, you know, power in the, in the United States. They see money. They see that Puerto Rico is, you know, a fairly poor, vulnerable nation. Of course, we should think and then talk about how it got there to be that way when the United States has been, you know, in charge for, for more than 120 years. Um, But, you know, the other thing I would say, and and you mentioned Ted Cruz and and Marco Rubio, um, and I think people like Rubio especially, but pretty much all politicians on both sides of the spectrum, you know, are mostly pandering on this issue. Um, And, you know, you mentioned the, (laughs) the stuff with the DNC and, you know, moves happen and somebody comes out in support for statehood and all of this is kind of, you know, talking points and fundraising. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, there's very little action uh, <laughs> from from either side. I mean, there's an outright rejection, I think, of, of statehood um, from from conservatives in, in the U.S. for understandable reasons. You know, they're not very interested in having a brown Spanish speaking nation um, join the join the U.S., um, one that's, you know, incredibly in, in debt uh, on top of it all. Um, and, you know, you have some like Rubio because he's in Florida and he wants to get elected who will, who will pander on this issue. Um, but, you know, the Democrats will talk a big game about this sometimes. And then when it comes right down to it, I don't truly believe that they support statehood either. or They don't want to have this this political fight, at least. Um, so, you know, that's the other big disconnect, I think, between how this issue is spoken about in, in the U.S. and how it's spoken in, in Puerto Rico and a lot of the kind of political maneuvering that's that's very cynical, I think, that happens in the U.S. Um, with Puerto Rico. And, you know, 
they keep talking and sort of making their moves and Puerto Rico remains a, a colony, which I think is, is incredibly shameful. Um, the independence movement uh, party, excuse me, did very well in the last election, better than they had in, in, in decades since, as you said, you know, I love when people always say, Oh, you know, they never do well. It's like, well, I mean, you did like lock up everybody. <laughs> yeah. You did like murder a bunch of leaders. The FBI did monitor them. They did kind of like try to kill the movement, but um, I love that. Like, Oh, they never do well. It's like, yeah. Cause you basically murdered them all. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> um, which you've, you've discussed, but you know, in the last election, um, the independence party did, did very well. Uh, and, and I, my guess is, you know, they're throwing out attacks now in fear that the party will continue to do better. Um, and given that Commonwealth Party is at its lowest point since modern elections, um, you know, Democratic facing elections, as, as you mentioned earlier. So is that kind of their strategy is just to throw out racism and identity politics? Or, or I don't even know what I, I don't, first of all, I don't know how you can be racist as an, I, what are you racist against? Right. I, I'm confused. It's not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's very strange because especially for these people who, who consider themselves progressives in the U S context, you know, they're basically throwing around an accusation of reverse racism, which I think if they tried in any <laughs> political conversation in the U S you know, they'd be rightfully um, left out of the room. Um, you know, I think the argument is that because us as independentistas, as people who, who believe that Puerto Rico is a nation, that, that Puerto Ricans are a distinct people um, who care about the preservation of our of our language and our culture, you know, that kind of rings a similar bell to them as, you know, nationalism or white nationalism in the U.S. But of course, we're talking about a completely different political context. You know, nationalism in Puerto Rico isn't white nationalism used to oppress, you know, um, marginalized groups. It's it's a form of resistance against, you know, more than 100 years of colonial domination. It's trying to ensure that um, our identity and our language and our culture does survive. And I think we have very good reasons to be concerned that um, that those things would be would be threatened under statehood. So I'm, you know, I'm as confused as you <laughs> as to, you know, how some of these these attacks come come about. Um, because, you know, I think when these people and, and that's part of what bothers me about it and where I wanted to write about it, I think there's such a double standard in how these people think and talk about politics in the American context um, in which they consider, you know, the the identities and the cultural manifestations and, you know, the, the desires of, of people of color in the U.S. as sacrosanct and worth, when worth protect, protecting. Um, but then when they think about Puerto Rico. And we are, you know, criticizing Americans for something or we are rejecting, you know, American influence, whether it's crypto bros or real estate magnets, you know, moving to, to Puerto Rico in ways that really harm, uh, you know, our, our society. Um, then suddenly we're being bigoted, you know, fascists even i have been called for for doing so. So it's, you know, it's frankly a little a little ridiculous, but I think it, it speaks to um, to this real telling double standard in, in how a lot of folks think about Puerto Rico status. I just don't understand who they're speaking to. I mean, this is why I think it's very online because, you know, there's so many radio hosts in on the island who are and people in office who go on uh, racist homophobic rants that are part of the statehood party. You know, the, the as I said, the resident commissioner is from statehood party and she aligned very closely with Trump. So I really don't understand who they're speaking to other than maybe just trying to silence people online um, by declaring, you know, they're racists. I think that's part of it. You know, I think they're trying to weaponize um, some of the ways that they see the the sort of political identitarian conversation happen in, in U.S. politics. Um, I also think they are trying to, you know, as I, as I mentioned, they know they've got no shot of having support from, from conservative Republicans. Um, so I think they're trying to sort of align themselves with, um, you know, Democrats or, or some liberals in the U.S. who might be open to this idea that actually, you know, forget about the fact that, you know, our, the congressional representative pro statehood is, is Latinos for Trump. We're actually the liberals in this debate. You know, we're actually the good guys, those people, you know, who want to preserve Spanish. That's some, you know, racist, you know, bigoted stuff about culture. Um, so I think that's part of the of the strategy as well. Um, I frankly don't think it's going to be very successful because, as you say, some of this is kind of very online. And um, I think some of the people that they wish in the U.S. were um, sort of listening and paying attention to these conversations aren't. Um, 
And and as I say in the piece, I ultimately I think it's a good thing that they're not because the uh, the attacks I believe would sort of backfire spectacularly if real progressives in the U.S. realize that they are you know accusing Puerto Ricans of you know being racist um, and and rejecting. Um, what they themselves in the U.S. context realize is a huge problem is, you know, white supremacy and the ways that, um, you know, institutional and economic power that is expressed through racial means sometimes, um, you know, ends up harming people's lives. Um, as you see in the piece, it's about, you know, there's this colonial mindset and the anti-colonialism is basically rejection of white supremacy, traditionally, I would say, and and not vice versa. Uh, you know, it's not it's not nationalism as an identity, as a, as a white identity, as nationalism, as preserving your own self-determined, your ability to self-determine, democracy, et cetera. Um, Alberto, super interesting. I don't feel like this topic's gonna go away anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, yeah. But I do hope it is something that, you know, Americans uh, start paying attention to more. My, my message uh, to American audiences is always, you know, um, I hear a lot. It's like, oh well, you know, it's not my role. It's not my. It's not my uh, appropriate for for me to get involved or to to have a position on this. Um, and I just think that's so wrong on on so many levels. I mean, the United States controls Puerto Rico. It just does. Um, you know, if there was ever any illusion that the U.S. was just waiting to see what Puerto Ricans would decide and and then the the U.S. would act. Um, you know, that's never been the case. We've held six plebiscites. None of them have been binding. You know, the U.S. has declined to make any of them binding. In the last one, statehood did win a very, very slim, you know, majority that people are, are arguing about to this day and, and should keep <laughs> arguing about. With a certain about. amount of turnout that was not necessarily reflective of the island, but yeah. Right. But, you know, that's always going to be the, the case. And, you know, and there's a the statehood bill in Congress right now, and I don't think anybody reasonably <laughs> believes that it's going to go anywhere. When you know, even DC can't achieve statehood with with much more support from uh, from Democrats um, and from the population as a whole, of course, than exists for for Puerto Rico statehood. Um, but you know, that can't be an excuse for doing nothing about it, because again, every second that we do not resolve this issue, Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States. Um, and it, it gets treated as such. And, and that has real consequences that that harm, um, you know, more than 3 million people's lives on the on the island. And no tax breaks seem to be saving it. <laughs> right, right. It's going to take a slightly different, you know, political and, and economic model. Yeah, yeah. Alberto, thank you so much for joining. Um, really interesting. Come back anytime you want to talk. And he's and some, something, you know, rolls up online. I'm sure there's going to be something. There's always something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks so much for having me and uh, happy to, thanks so much for covering this issue, which as I said, most, <laughs> a lot of Americans don't, but it's it's wonderful when there's conversation about it and happy to, to be back anytime. Sounds good. <laughs> Take care. Hey, everyone. I'm finally over my jet lag. <laughs> This is really important because it took me forever. No, but I was able to get over my jet lag because I have a newfound love for CBD uh, that has been going on for the last seven months since I was introduced to Sunset Lake CBD, since our dear friend Sam Cedar said, no, no, CBD is not a scam. You get those ideas out of your mind, you crazy lady. Uh, no, he didn't say that. Uh, but the truth is, I did used to think CBD was a scam because I just grabbed one of those random products from the corner of the street and in a bodega, not just like on the corner of a street. And it didn't work. And I spent a lot of money and that was that. But then I learned about Sunset Lake CBD because Sam raved about it and changed so much. Changed my sleep patterns. I mean, it's amazing. Sunset Lake CBD is a farmer owned company that ships craft CBD products directly from their farm in Vermont to your door. Sunset Lake CBD has all sorts of products for everyone. They offer tinctures and gummies and salves and coffee, which my mom loves, all designed to help with stress, aches, and pains. There's other products as well. Dog biscuits, chocolates, fudge. Uh, they were originally a farm in Vermont that was a Ben and Jerry's farm. We know how great Ben and Jerry's is, supporting progressive causes from the beginning, uh, but they decided to shift and diversify and grow premium hemp. When you support Sunset Lake CBD, you are supporting sustainable agriculture in Vermont that helps enhance rural community, a rural community, and it creates meaningful employment uh, in that community because 
not only are they progressive, they have a minimum wage of $15 an hour and the employees own the majority of the company. But on top of all that, they support shows like our show and the David Pakman show and the majority report because it helps us grow and obviously pay the bills. And they're just really wonderful because of that. Um, I, you know, I use all sorts of products. I've tried pretty much everything uh, on the list. I love the gummies. We all know that. I love the chocolate. I love the coffee because it wakes me up, but it doesn't make me frazzled. Uh, but I have been using the salve a lot lately because I don't know, I've just been getting like weird rashes on my arms um, that I think are just from, I don't know, from the heat and from wearing bracelets in the heat. And so I've been using it because it also has Arnica on it. So it stops me from itching, but it's done wonders. When I use it every day, at least it does wonders. I'm not really good at doing things every day, uh, but I definitely recommend trying their, their salve. It's, it's organic beeswax and it's Arnica, which is another product I love. And it helps you with sore muscles and joints and also, you know, preventing you from itching. Um, of course, the tincture, tincture helps me sleep all night like through the night, which is impossible for me. Um, when I forget to do it, I am tossing and turning. It is a, it makes a huge, huge, huge difference in my lifestyle and keeps me well rested. I don't sleep in. It's amazing. You too can find these products at sunsetlakecbd.com. And if you type in Nomi, N-O-M-I, you get 20% off of your entire order when you go to sunsetlakecbd.com and just type in Nomi, N-O-M-I, and you can check out all the products. They're always offering deals. And um, yeah, love, love, love Sunset Lake CBD. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. Natalie Shore is a writer and researcher. She focuses on health, politics, and history. Uh, she has a recent piece out in the New Republic titled Abolish the Olympics. Oh my God, could you get more controversial than that? Uh, you can go check out that article. It came out last week in the New Republic. And of course, the Olympics start on Friday. So could not be more timely. And of course, Rep Rab is back. Rep Chris Rab represents the 200th district in Philadelphia, uh, Philadelphia County in Northwest Philly in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. He's been there since 2013. And he is the author of uh, what is the book that you're author of that I've read? Invisible Capital. Invisible Capital. Oh, oh my God. Forces. It's not Thank in here. And I'm like, and I know this by heart. I can't believe this. And you gave me an extra term and a half. I came in in 2016, the same night as what's his name? Why did it say 2017 in here? Well, oh, no, no, but you were technically, inaugur I was inaugurated in 2017, yeah. but I was elected in 2000. Okay. Okay. Very dismal election cycle. See, when we're not, now that we're not live, I'm like, not <laughs> just like, ah, you know, and I've introduced you so many times that, yeah. that I do know your book by heart and I've yes. read it because you handed it to me. And then I read it on the train back up to New York, but you know, we're human. All right. With that being said, um, Natalie, I am in Greece and this is, I'm surprised there aren't riots right now based on your article. I am just a couple of streets away from the stadium, the famous stadium where the first Olympics were held. Last week, I was at this, this conference in which um, the former prime minister of, of Greece, uh, you know, he, he, he hosted the conference, uh, the central left party, you know, they put on this symposium for everybody. Um, and he, you know, the Olympics came up a lot about how important it is for bringing people together from around the world. Uh, it is for identity. We just did a, a segment on Puerto Rico uh, before this, and it's very important for the Puerto, Puerto Rican identity and that they have their own Olympic team. Um, and, you know, there's there's camaraderie. Uh, it's, it's the first form of diplomacy, as George Papandreou said, former prime minister of Greece. So you're going to be a buzzkill. Why do we have to abolish the Olympics? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that the things you're saying uh, are of mixed merit. I do think it's okay to like the Olympics. A lot of people really do. That's totally fine. I think they're fun to watch on TV. I get why people are excited by them. I don't necessarily think that there's a lot of evidence that they serve any diplomatic value. If anything, I think that they probably fuel nationalism rather than internationalism. But even if that's not true, all of that aside, I don't think that any of the good things about the Olympics offset the very, very bad things about the Olympics. Since the 1980s, uh, around 2 million people have been displaced uh, to make way for Olympic villages, new constructions, hotels, things of that nature. Uh, they've gone over budget 100% of the time since 1960, and host cities are on the hook for that. Uh, after the game, 
teams leave. They stay in town for just, you know, a couple weeks. Millions of people have gotten displaced to make room for it. And then after that happens, a lot of cities are left with empty stadiums that don't get used. Uh, it's just really hard for me to think that the Olympics justifies those downsides. There's so much going on. And I, I just, don't think that there's any reason to keep doing them. It's a sporting event. It's an entertainment event that goes on for a few weeks. We don't need it. So, so I'm, I'm curious when you see people get displaced. Um, I mean, here in Athens, it was notorious in 2004 prior to the financial crisis, uh, you know, a decade prior, but it became part of the financial crisis conversation was just how much of a detriment the, the 100th anniversary or 200th anniversary, whatever it was of the Olympic games, whatever it was, the official number um, being here, in Athens, it, it wrecked the city that was already dealing with, you know, major financial issues. Um, but when you say displaced, what do you mean by that? Like they forced people to move from their homes to, to, to build stadia? Like what, what's happening? Yeah, so displacement can mean a few things. In some cases, people are literally forced to move from their homes because they sequester an area to build a new stadium or to build the Olympic Village, which is the housing complex for athletes themselves and people traveling with teams. Uh, I think that there are also a lot of people who are displaced because landlords living or landlords with buildings anywhere near where the games are going to be find ways to evict their tenants, to force them out. Uh, that's happening with Airbnb a lot in Los Angeles, and their games aren't supposed to be held until 2028. There are already all of these reports of landlords ousting tenants who are in areas where they think that they can make a lot more money with Airbnb. Uh, so there are a few mechanisms by which it happens, but it's affected millions of people, and it's a serious problem. I mean, I'm opening this up to, to Rep. Rab. Uh, Philly hosted the Democratic Convention a few years ago. I, I think that they're like, obviously, the Olympics is a much, much bigger issue. Um, and but, you know, this happens to so many different cities who've hosted Super Bowls and uh, major sporting events, major conferences. You know, the Democratic Convention, when it was being debated, you know, whether it was going to go to Wisconsin, one of the biggest issues was the the actual city could not. I mean, there there wasn't the capacity. They couldn't hold that many people coming, supposedly, but the pandemic prevented that from happening. I mean, in from Pennsylvania and in, in Philly, we it was impossible in Philly, one of you know the major cities of our country, it was impossible to house enough people for the Democratic convention. This is a problem. And 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 we're seeing it at the micro level all the way to obviously the international level. So Rep Rep, I mean, you're you're there in Philly. Like what kind of uh, effect did it have on your your city when you have these major sporting events or big, uh, you know, big events, national events? Well, I mean, I think a couple of things, but um, it had a chilling effect on democracy itself and the First Amendment. The two classes of, of folks, folks who had access to the convention and the folks who um, chose to express their First Amendment rights, um, who were kept far at bay from, from the insiders. That was problematic. Um, and then, of course, just the the capitalist ecosystem around any major event. And Natalie, I had not thought about the Olympics explicitly in the way that you have um, uh, provided an overview of your article. And I find it deeply controversial and I find it problematic because I agree with everything you said. <laughs> <laughs> I So I didn't have the words for the uh, for the feelings I've had. For you know, decades now, I love um, excellence in any field. I love like hyper excellence, like the what it takes to be an Olympian is something that is virtually unfathomable for the average person like me. Um, I also love sportsmanship or whatever the appropriate gender term is. Um, I love that, love it. Um, I hate nationalism. And I find it silly that we're supporting nations where they don't really, I mean, you know, there's so much fluidity between these, you know, these borders that are we really celebrating? So when I asked my son who was watching um, uh, England versus Denmark, or maybe it was Denmark, uh, England versus Wales, I forget which, is in soccer recently. And I said, why are you going with England? He said, there's all black folk on the team. And it sounded like my grandfather back in the 80s when we 
followed football uh, teams that had a black quarterback. It's still that same kind of connection and a transcendent nationalism to something that had a deeper resonance with folks whose first urge is not something around nationalism. And I think we can reinvent excellence in athletics and all of these things without having to both double down on nationalism and also don't have to be complicit in this type of Olympic level gentrification. Because I remember what the Olympics did to Atlanta. It rarely helps black and brown folks, working class folks, and it rarely helps the long-term benefit of the cities that are you know, um, occupied by these Olympic corporate interests. And um, we need to, you know, we need to uh, reimagine what international sporting and other kind of events can look like. And so I really appreciate that you've dared to write this article. <laughs> There's also different industries that kind of come with these big events, whether it's Olympics or Super Bowl. We know that, um, you know, there, there's there's sex trade that happens around and there's violent sex crimes that happen as a result. Um, drug industry, you know, it, it, all these like the, the, the domino effect can have um, rever- reverberating effect on communities, uh, maybe not for the long term, but at least for that time period. And, and of course, as, as you mentioned, the corporate aspect. I'm going to offer one little sliver of a devil's advocate here. Not everything, not every country presented is coming to the Olympics from, you know, the supremacist world domination perspective. I'll I'll use Puerto Rico as an example again, just because we just talked about it right before the segment. No, in 2004, the Puerto Rican basketball team defeated the U.S. basketball team, which was had, had never happened. It was like they were untouchable. And this meant so much for Puerto Rican identity, especially in relationship with the colonial power that the U.S. is. And surely there are many, many other countries that have a very similar when they when they are prideful of their I don't want to use nationalism, but of their identity. It, these are the opportunities for them to be on the world stage with a Russia, with a China, with a with the U.S., whom they're never, <laughs> they're never on equal uh, footing with, so you know there is that aspect of it as well. I just you know just to make sure that folks. And I think that's a great it. point, and it, it underscores a bigger issue around the structural inequality of of Olympic Games and the and the um, the the infrastructure that allows some teams to flourish. Um, so when you have, you know, upsets like Puerto Rico or um, I think Cameroon years ago in soccer or what have you, it's it's a David and Goliath. Right. But it's not many people think for, you know, wrongly that there's a, a level playing field. And that's simply not the case. Right. There are Olympians who started in poverty, who prevail in poverty and return to poverty. And, you know, if we're going to really talk about international um, sports and competition, then we cannot allow for that um, um, for those for that infrastructure to remain invisible and unchallenged and uncritiqued. And so if that's the only reason people read your article, just to to think about things that they've never had to think about before, uh, that's 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 progress to me. Natalie, what's the response been like? Um, You know, I mean, for the most part, uh, I think that people liked reading it. I should say, you know, I didn't invent these arguments. There have been a lot of people doing, you know, research and organizing around these topics for a long time. And, you know, I just tried to gather a synthesis. I was surprised by how many people weren't familiar with some of these ideas that, uh, you know, I, I think that when confronted with some of these things for the first time, people people are kind of surprised to hear it. They had heard some rumblings that there were some bad things about the Olympics, but hadn't quite seen it itemized in one place. And, you know, I think even people who who really like sports and really like the Olympics, uh, you know, found found themselves challenged uh, by the idea that so many bad things come out of it, especially when, you know, I'm not saying let's get rid of sports, let's get rid of spectator sports. You could have, you know, the global competition of each individual sport without having it consolidated within one city uh, in a way that, you know, disrupts life in that place so dramatically. Uh, So, you know, I hope at the very least these are reimagined within the next few years because I don't think it's sustainable to keep doing what we're doing. And I I think that people 
you know, have to rethink about whether we need these things at all. Uh, you know, people, people think of oh, the Olympics, we've done them for, you know, as long as anyone's been alive uh, since 1896, the modern ones, but we don't have to keep doing it. It's, it's a sporting event. It's an entertainment event. It's a, it's a fine one. Uh, but you know, we, we could, we could rethink the way that we do it. We could have them in a less centralized way. We could, you know, just break them off into individual sports more of a regional thing. I don't know. Different people have different ideas, but I think it's definitely time to go back on to the, go back to the drawing board to rethink what these could be. Same place every year. You know, all these different options, perhaps, I don't know. Um, okay. I know it's not on our topic list, but just because of this and because it was such big news yesterday, I know nothing about basketball. So like, we don't have to get into the sporting side of this, please. Like, <laughs> but Yanni okay. Talk about, you know, Chris, you know, you mentioned rep rap, you mentioned, um, you know, Yanni's, Greek refugee, uh, a lot of nationalism in this country happening. Um, the Golden Dawn, you know, is 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 now uh, a criminal organization where they were, you know, murdering folks who are advocating for uh, refugees. And and right now, the the government of the prime minister of Greece is there's a lot of pushback happening because they say he's violating um, international human rights in pushing back refugees from Turkey right now, which is against uh, international law. Yanis, of course, was a refugee who is selling CDs on the street and tapes on the street in a neighborhood not too far from where I am right now and was playing basketball from, you know, just a few blocks away from where I am right now. And but there's a lot of problems in this that he is like, as you said, Rep Rab, he's an exception. Right. This is not this is not the norm. And just the system of inequity that's happening, whether it's college basketball and not getting paid properly and injuring yourself and then not having a career moving forward or not, you know, these are very unusual circumstances, but also teachable moments. So I don't know if you have any comments on, on, uh, what happened yesterday in basketball, which I don't know. It was like a big, it was a big deal, right? Um, I is, don't is know. A, bit of a big deal. You don't know. I, I You're haven't, talking about I haven't, sports. I, Does anybody I'm, know? Oh my God. I'm going to get so much hate on our comments right listen, now. You have there, was like an, there was like a, there was a championship and he got the big championship thing right and like his two brothers also got it you have outed me <laughs> my <laughs> when it comes to sports you know, I, I, spending, I, my, <laughs> when it comes to sports i get my all of my advice and information from my 15 year old son he has an encyclopedic he? memory he's 15 he knows everything if if i had been pitched this i would have yeah, exactly he, he'd be a lot more interesting i'm sure but i do want to say to a larger point that um uh, and this is what Natalie, I'm just kind of amplifying something Natalie said earlier. Um, we, we do have to um, question and understand the origins of the traditions and institutions we embrace, because too often we embrace these things reflexively without knowing the actual truth or the context in which these things emerged. And we're doing that with the NCAA. We are acknowledging that it is essentially a plantation, that it is a corporation, that these kids, most of whom will not make it to professional sports um, who may, who are likely to be injured, who may get substandard education, they're creating extraordinary wealth and they're overwhelmingly um, uh, black and they deserve um, uh, a piece of the pie. And now we're seeing that. In fact, Pennsylvania, we just passed a law that said um, uh, uh, students in who go to universities, colleges, universities who play in NCAA in Pennsylvania, um, that they own their likeness. They get a piece of the pie. Um, we weren't, this was not in the mainstream a few years ago. Some folks were talking about it in the margins, but it was not something that we thought was doable. And that's happening. And I think that's the importance of uh, the type of journalism that Natalie's doing. It's the type of importance for independent media and what you're doing, that we have to push back on these corporate narratives that somehow that they will find a way. Listen, if Coca-Cola can say, yes, this sugar water should be associated with the best performing athletes in the world, you know, there's a problem, right? And if they can get you to think that, you know, Coke or any of these pr products that are the worst things for performance are, you know, bread and butter are, you know, part of the fabric of high performing athletes, you know they're selling us a bill of goods. So we have to push back. And I, I think these stories, these counter narratives are essential. Uh, no, marijuana is the biggest thing that hinders certain <laughs> athletes. Right, right. 
So um, on that note, uh, producer Brad makes a very great point that uh, just like the NCAA and Olympic athletes also don't get uh, any cut of the huge profits generated through ad revenue, et cetera, all the different aspects of, of revenue. With that being said, you know who else doesn't get um, part of the profits? It's Amazon workers. And uh, Jeff Bezos does not like the progressive pushback of him going to space uh, on <laughs> the backs of the Amazon workers that made it possible for him to do so. Let's play this clip of, of uh, the reaction to the progressive pushback. Progressive oh. Democrats who tweeted out today saying this is basically a, a boondoggle. It's it's a waste of money. There's more important things. To to that, what do you say? I mean, you you gave an answer in, in the money you gave two hundred million dollars away today. But yeah, what, I, what is the importance of this? What I would say is, first and foremost, we have to do both. So we have to, for example, we have lots of problems on Earth, and we have uh, we have poverty, we have hunger, we have all kinds of problems, we have climate disasters, we have pollution. It, it, we have to work on the here and now, and and we have to look to the future. And we as a society, as a civilization, as humanity, we've always done that. We've never just focused on the present or just focused on and the future. And what happens if we don't do this if exploration? If you don't focus, focus on the future, then you don't have explorers, you don't have progress. You know, what if you said to Wilbur and Orville Wright, you know, hey guys, you know, why don't you work on something with, with a little more practical? Mm. <laughs> You're smart, guys. Surely you could use your brains to do something a little more practical. But that's what exploration is. It's a kind of wandering. And all research and development and all small things have that characteristic that they're not obvious how they're going to work out. But that's what exploration is. Ugh. Oh, oh, oh well, I, did yeah, I think start I have to work a little bit in my mouth. <laughs> oh, God, that was awful. Natalie, I didn't know that all this major uh, research and development came from billionaires and, and it wasn't like through government. And, government. Uh, oh, anything's wrong with that segment. Let's just break it apart. Okay, let's start with just the aspect of research and development. And then let's go to climate change and all the other things that you care so much about. <laughs> Income inequality, poverty, the unhoused. Continue, continue. Natalie, reaction. The vast majority of basic science research has been publicly funded. Uh, that's true in the U.S. context. That was true, you know, in the Soviet context when they were very big into space exploration. Uh, that's true research in other countries. I mean, the private sector lags significantly, significantly behind uh, the public sector when it comes to uh, basic long term science research. And it's because that's the kind of research that is absolutely integral, but doesn't yield quarterly profits in the way that the private sector desperately wants. Uh, and so if we didn't have the public supporting important research, uh, we'd be in a completely different place that we are now. Uh, and, you know, entrepreneurs who love to claim that they themselves built this when it'd be in a different place too. Uh, Amazon has surely benefited from plenty of public sector research, research over the years. And uh, I wish that they would admit that more instead of playing space games. Space you, games. Space games. Space games. In a, in, a, 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 <laughs> in a cute little white phallus. It's wonderful. Yes. Um, it, it is so <laughs> you always do this, um, Nomi. You 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 make the you put up these cringeworthy videos, and I'm just like this, you're killing me. There, it's it was so bad on so many fronts. First of all, you can't compare yourself to to Orville, Orville and Wilbur Wright. You can't do that because I don't know the ins and outs of their exploration, but I assure you it wasn't based on hundreds or thousands of, of underpaid folks um, to make that exploration possible. I, I don't know the origins and, I'm, I, you know, it, it may be more than what I learned in school. It normally is. But in terms of scale, no, his extraordinary wealth with Amazon was by leveraging public policy and private sector and the public markets. Um, to exploit the, the labor, uh, the value of labor, of, of, of his labor force. And we subsidized the impoverishment of the people who were fully employed by the richest person in world history. So that is um, a, a disingenuous argument. It is not an apples to ab apples argument. And also um, some of the biggest uh, U.S. corporations were able to get off the ground 
from government resources, like directly, not just indirectly, like say the internet. And then people said, okay, let me commercialize the internet. I'm talking about, you know, grants that went directly to specific businesses, whether it's FedEx or Microsoft. So that's rarely talked about. And then the, the other piece is the U.S. is not leading in terms of percentage of GDP going to R&D like other countries. Um, that's just not the case. Um, and I guess the, the other piece, too, is we have this little thing called NASA. We could we could fully fund NASA. We could have NASA have um, priorities that are in line with um, uh, climate action and other equity issues um, so that we would not need to feel like to defer to billionaires with their with their space games. Um, well, and simultaneously, it's, it's, it's used as a defense mechanism now uh, more so. And, and I mean, I'm not an expert on NASA, but, you know, there, these are conversations that we should be having in a much more right. robust way about when we do fund NASA again or fully fund NASA again. Is it for space? What are the purposes of space exploration? Is it about sending the billionaires to space or, or whatever? Their, I don't know what their goals are. Um, exactly. Exactly. And, and yeah. you know, the, I think we have to connect the dots because any any agency is can be can evolve or devolve right and it's based on the extent to which we we know what they're doing we hold them accountable there's appropriate transparency uh funding equity all of those issues um and, and who runs it right so nasa may have drifted may have all, you know, it can be what we want it to be if if we have the political will to make it so and it reminds me of a uh, sarah palin moment where she was talking about why are we spending all these millions of dollars on fruit flies, you know, studying fruit flies. And it turns out that that um, research uh, related to, I believe, um, research in autism um, and was actually related to some of the things that her family benefited from having us a, uh, a child uh, who was on a spectrum. We have to connect the dots. We have to show that these things are interconnected. And if they're not interconnected, how do we make sure that we are going forward? So it's not about a space race for the militarization um, of, of you know, the great beyond. And it's actually about helping um, those most in need on Earth. Uh, and, and with that, you know, the messaging around how Amazon has deeply affected the environment through supply chain issues and energy production. I mean, I think that there is such a disconnect. I, I feel like we as progressives could do more to... Um, tax policy is extremely important. Where I think that's that's hitting a nerve and really making it into the mainstream. But we should simultaneously be challenging these tech companies around um, issues related to the environment, whether it's supply chain with with Amazon or crypto, which is like driving me crazy that they're they're pulling all these progressives into and, crypto as a whole. Their conversation. And listen, if we're and Nomi, if if we're going to abolish the Olympics or have the conversation around it, let's abolish billionaires too. Let's Just abolish like that. It. Because, look, if we need to have a wealth tax and maybe it's a reentry tax, you know, yeah. if you're coming yeah. back from space and you're not a, a government entity, you need to be taxed, um, you know, appropriately. But we have to put a tax on this because this is a problem I have with corporate media. When uh, what's his name on CNN? Um, uh, Anderson Cooper said, oh, well, you know, you're giving money to to my friends who I work with, you know, 100 million to Van Jones. who I've known a long that? time. What? That is that is one of the most offensive things ever because philanthropy is choice. not policy. Yes. Right? And what he should pay just as a billionaire would be radically more than $200 million. And it should be radically more than $200 million. And we can use that money to do the things in ways that don't just benefit um, celebrity activists and their causes. and we have to look at the structural issues. We have to look at systems of oppression. And that doesn't happen when he decides who among his buddies is going to get a lump sum. It is deeply, deeply problematic. Natalie, final thoughts on Jeff Bezos? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think also if you just look at the broader uh, political context here, uh, I think it's you know pretty hard to divorce it, uh, the huge interest in billionaire space flight. The fact that you know, I think capitalism is a system that is predicated on endless growth, right? And climate change is the ultimate limit to endless growth. 
right? We can't keep endlessly growing for profit in the way that capitalism demands. Now, all of a sudden, they're very interested in space flight. I think it's basically a way to try to circumvent the limits placed to their aspirations on Earth. And my preferred method of limiting their aspirations would be to take their money and redistribute it. Uh, I think that that's probably a lot better than putting Jeff Bezos in a rocket ship, unless we're not planning on bringing him back, in which case I'm willing to entertain the idea. <laughs> Can you imagine if their taxpayer dollars, we can start off the show talking about this, went to things like infrastructure, things that need to be improved when climate change is attacking us. Um, you know, I've, I've been... I've been on this, uh, you know, road trip <laughs> the last few months, whether it's Puerto Rico or New York. Um, you know, everybody, many countries with austerity or regions with austerity, including New York, who don't have the infrastructure in place to withstand the effects of climate change. And it is the norm. It is not the new norm. New York power went out in the 70s, power went out in the early 2000s, power went out in, in, in 2013. And for a week, I mean, we couldn't even imagine back then having to take water jugs up to 15 stories to elderly who couldn't make it down every day to get water. This is what's happening now. And yet we're still, it's like we're crisis to crisis, not understanding that's where that money is supposed to go. So if you want to fight climate change or get rid of the sins of your, your actions, then you know the least you could do is that. Um, on that note, Germany, 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 wealthy Germany, Germany, great infrastructure, they're efficient. They take things like climate change supposedly seriously. Uh, major floods, major floods over the past few days. Let's um, let's play the first clip, which does a quick little overview of, of what's been happening in Germany and then how it relates to public policy after that. And rescue efforts for survivors in Western Europe are intensifying after the worst flooding in decades as the death toll continues to climb. NBC News correspondent Megan Fitzgerald has more. Days after catastrophic devastation, the best of humanity. So many people came to uh, ask, can we help? It's nice, nice uh, feeling. Neighbors and strangers helping each other clean up after the worst flooding Germany has seen in more than half a century. So many people have lost everything. Decades of memories, now piles of rubble lining the streets of neighborhoods across Western Germany. Three months worth of rain falling in 24 hours. Streams and creeks turned into raging rivers, tearing through towns, washing away roads and bridges, and everything in its path. So many people dead. <sighs> the death toll nearing 200, while police continue searching for the more than 300 still unaccounted for. The trauma of the devastation is setting in. They wanted to help them, but, but they couldn't. He was calling, "Help, help! I can't swim." There was little neighbors could do in the face of the surging water but doing as much as they can now to help each other rebuild. Our thanks to NBC's Megan Fitzgerald for that report. Okay. So obviously these, these storms, um, I, 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 was, I was at a conference when, um, when the flooding started and I was with Germans and other people uh, from Western Europe and it, it was a shock. I mean, at least from the immediate reaction was there was no anticipation of, of this happening. Um, so I, I want to play this other clip and then I you know, want to get your assessment from two, two perspectives, um, the climate change perspective and also just how equipped we are <laughs> in, in uh, you know, whether it's Germany, who seems to be more equipped than most countries are um, in handling the effects of climate change. So let's play this one about the uh, alert system. Now to Western Europe, where questions are being asked about why an alert system failed to warn residents before flash flooding ripped through their towns, washing away communities and killing nearly 200 people. CNN's Fred Pleitkin is in one of Germany's most devastated areas. So, Fred, what do we know about what happened? Mm. Mm. Hi there, Allison. Well, that certainly is one of the big questions that are being asked is why this alert system uh, didn't save more lives than it actually did. I mean, we have to keep in mind the place where I'm standing right now, where all the infrastructure was damaged, more than 100 people have now been confirmed dead 
in this little town alone. And the real tragic thing uh, for, for the Germans really about this is, is that the warnings were there. The German Weather Service did warn of severe weather, warned of torrential rain. However, that didn't necessarily reach the people who were here on the ground. What people were telling us is, yes, they were expecting a, a lot of rain to come down, but they weren't expecting the kind of damage that you see right behind me uh, right here right now. There was no evacuation order. There was no order for people to pay, uh, perhaps go on the uh, second story of their buildings to bring themselves to safety. And I was speaking to some residents today, and they said in the span of about 15 minutes, this little river that you see behind me, which is normally a really calm river, it rose to above the first floor of the buildings around here, uh, obviously destroying everything in its path and also killing scores of people. There was one person who told me that he saw one of his neighbors who was trying to clutch onto something and then had to let go, and her body was later recovered. So the early warning system is certainly something where the Germans are now saying, with the climate emergency the way it is right now, these weather warnings need to be taken more seriously. Warnings need to be taken more seriously. People need to be evacuated earlier. Uh, and Allison, finally, one of the other things that the Germans are saying right now is they're obviously going to have to rebuild all this. They need to rebuild the infrastructure in the way uh, that it will not be damaged the way that it was by the climate emergency because they certainly believe uh, that freak weather incidents like the ones that we saw here in Germany that caused these floodings, they certainly believe those are going to become more frequent in the future, Allison. Hmm. Okay, so he, he, he makes this point. <laughs> um, remember the tsunami that happened in Southeast Asia? Of course, we're old enough all to remember that. Uh, th this is a similar, I mean, just, just that, my initial reaction, and I, I went to Taiwan soon after that, and it was kind of like astounding to see how fast they rebuilt the infrastructure, but it was the tourist industry that facilitated much of that infrastructure rebuilt because it was, because the economy is reliant on that and there were investors related. Um, I think what reminds me of this is, is, is just how the lack of preparation, right? So, you know, he says they knew that their storms were going to be severe. Okay, fine. We're in the climate change era there. How do you know now? How does government respond? The government, you know, they're more equipped than most governments, but, you know, bring it to the U S we would be having a debate for 15 years on Fox news about whether or not the storm was real or not real or whatever, or you should wear a mask or not wear a mask. <laughs> um, but if, if government can't even prepare or can't even take care of itself, how are they going to be able to respond in any country, especially the, the, the wealthiest countries who under the EU with regulation, how are they able to respond in a way, forget about the signaling, just recognizing that severe weather today versus the severe weather that was last week is psychologically, how are they able to communicate that to the people so that they're able to take it seriously? I mean, we're having that issue in our, in our own country because we live from crisis to crisis and, and you know, whatever TV drama it is that desensitizes us. Um, Rep, Rep, you're nodding. So you're in government. How do you, how do you communicate with people if this is like real this time and you have to do something? I, I, I have alerts from Philadelphia um, every time there's an extreme weather situation. I have gotten so many text messages uh, on different days this summer because of se severe thunderstorms. Um, I'm now, I didn't know tornadoes happened in cities. I didn't grow up in a world where there were tornadoes in actual uh, urban areas. That was supposed to happen in rural areas. And now we're seeing tornadoes in cities. And, but because we're, we're inundated with alerts, we're not inundated with the context and educating about what we need to do differently and how we need to hold government accountable because most government is not, government is made up of people. The same people who live on our blocks, we elect our neighbors. My neighbors elected me, but I'm pro-science, but there's a lot of folks who are anti-science and so much so that in my state, we just passed a constitutional amendment to um, remove the power from the executive branch, from the governor to declare emergencies. We now say we have to give it to the legislature. Wait, what use is that to the right wing? I am sorry. What use is that to the, to the pro uh, capitalist forces that are backing the right wing? What do they get out of that? What's Not the point? nothing, but here's, but here's, and this is related to my initial point. There is short-term gain from the far right non-science folks who are not doing it for, for corporate interests. Corporate interests uh, collectively are cowardly. They are not, they can say, because they have money that they distribute quite generously to Republicans and corporate Democrats. 
they could say, we're not playing this game anymore. This is serious. This hurts the bottom line. This hurts the workforce. This hurts the environment. This hurts our democracy. And we're not playing these games. But they're too cowardly to do so. The far right who I have to work with um, in Harrisburg, they hate the, the Democratic governor. And because they believe they will always be in power, just like the Democrats thought they would be in power for another 40 years. Because when I came in, when I worked in the Senate, Democrats had been in power for 40 years and Newt Gingrich woke them up overnight and said, nope. So there's a certain level of collective hubris that says we will always be here. So let the Republican legislature decide because we don't like Democrats being in control and we have controlled the legislature for 30 years. And it's short sighted, but that is the hallmark of the Republican Party and of capitalism. It is intentionally and inherently short sighted. Natalie, the floor is yours. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think that everything that uh, Rep. Rap said is right. I think that, uh, you know, increasingly we see science and, you know, the underlying arguments of why we do have to confront industry to avert climate disaster. Uh, that's obviously something that very much bugs capital and corporations who fund the Republican Party and whose agenda the Republican Party exists to enact. Uh, and so I think that we increasingly see the science of climate change and, uh, you know, related public health issues as being a, you know, culture war wedge issue. Uh, and that that's sort of the game that they're playing, you know, pushing back against it, trying to, you know, frame it as liberal hysteria. Um, you know, if you do that, then you don't have to deal with the economic reorientation that fighting climate change will require. I mean, we do need a ton of public goods, public resources, public research, uh, money for infrastructure. All of those things are going to have to be uh, done through the public sector and not the private one. And that is something that I think is very existentially threatening to capital and to moneyed interests more generally. Uh, they're not making that argument, of course. They're making, you know, goofier anti-science arguments uh, in the popular media. And I think in some cases, convincing people that those are true, uh, I think that it's going to take organizing on a very broad and deep level to counteract that. Climate change doesn't kill us, the plague will. So <laughs> same problems, same problems, guys. Um, it's exhausting. And, you know, we had this, I was at this conference last week with, with a lot of people from the EU and, and, and Eastern Europe and other um, Turkey as well and Israel and uh, all from the left. And it was really fascinating was the Americans, they were like, stop all of us. We didn't all come from the same backgrounds or organizations, but there was an exasperated uh, tone coming from each of us individually saying, stop relying on the, stop thinking the U.S. is going to solve this. And it's fascinating to see how these geopolitics play, play out because I think there's a conditioning that there, a global conditioning, um, at least in, in the Western, uh, the EU, that the U.S. is going to in some way intervene or take a position or et cetera, et cetera. And we are completely frozen. Um, so, you know, as they know very well from, from the Trump era, but it's a deconditioning. It's how do you get off of this conditioning of the U.S. will at the end do what's right. And the Biden administration is going to save us. But, uh, you know, perhaps we have to start looking um, in a different direction. But Rob, Natalie Scherr, love having you on. Thank you for joining us, talking about the, I, every time Natalie's on, I'm like, apocalypse, apocalypse, <laughs> save me. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> <laughs> but that's sort of where we are. <laughs> I don't. I don't mean to do that. I'm sorry about. Well, you're that. not doing it. It's just like something happens when the topics just happen to line up that way. Um, but that's you know that's the state of the world right now. Stay safe. Protect yourself with the Delta. I don't know what the latest is where, where we stand on this, but just stay safe to everybody else um, as well who's listening and watching. Um, but thank you for everything. Thank you for being on. All right, everybody, uh, I have a couple shout outs to do. Thank you to everybody in the live chats. Thank you to all of our moderators. Thank you to everybody slaying the trolls. We're truly appreciative of you. Um, we are, of course, this is our new format. So make sure to set your clock for 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. 
Uh, that is when we're going to be airing on Wednesdays and Fridays. And to our patrons, if you're not a patron, please join us on Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show. You can check us out on audio version. We have some special highlights. We're going to have a couple of announcements in the coming weeks. Um, but please, please, please join us on patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show. Support us in whatever way possible if you can. If you can't, please let us know. We can work something out. We have a lot of ways of doing that. But that's what uh, makes sure that this show continues to go on the road. Um, and I apologize to all of our sports fans because I can't believe no one at our panel knew uh, what had happened yesterday. But it was the um, NBA Finals between the Milwaukee. It was it was the Milwaukee Bucks that won, and Giannis uh, won, and it was a big deal. It was a big deal here. It was a big deal in the states. Um, and I feel like we might have to do a whole segment on this to make up for it. And I will find someone because I just don't have the sports. I just know the refugee part. I just know the political side. So maybe we can do some sort of um, intersectional sports commentary about this because I'm embarrassed that I thought somebody was just going to like pick up and fill in the, the blanks, but that's why we plan shows. We don't just do things off the cuff. Um, oh, Brad goes, I'm literally from Milwaukee and I didn't know that that happened. <laughs> it's embarrassing. <laughs> Clearly there's a type of person who is part of our immediate friends and family of the Nomiki show. All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. We will see you on Friday for Fun Friday. We're going to have a great show, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Go check us out at patreon.com slash, slash the Nomiki show. You can also get swag there. Uh, I'm not really pushing the stuff I should be. We've got mugs, bags, stickers, all sorts of fun stuff. Go check it out. Um, and we appreciate you and stay in solidarity. The Nomiki show. Clash momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from elites, oligarchs stay fed. Deep state, faith fed. Everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion in this melted pot. We live in time to build a new system. Unionize labor rights. Highlight the issue. Talking heads left is best. The saga continues. Continues. The No Miki Show.